Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm Racing Post editor Tom Kerr. It's Monday, December 12th, and this is The Front Page. It's been a freezing cold week, and while most of us have been shivering beneath duvets and blankets, our race courses have been trussed up in fleeces. Little good it has done mostly, unfortunately. But while there hasn't been much action taking place on the track, there's been plenty to discuss off it. And joining me in the studio to discuss it today is John Harding. Welcome, John. Good morning. Since your last appearance on this, of course, you have uh, become an award-winning journalist, or a multiple award-winning journalist, Specialist Writer of the Year. Congratulations on that. Thank you very How much. How long did the celebrations go on for? I sort of reached a crossroads of this is going until the early hours or I'm going to be at home with a pizza at a reasonable time. And I took the latter, luckily. Luckily. Good on you. A consummate professional, as exemplified by the fact you've made it in battling wind, snow, hail, traffic disruption, and the rest of it. Not something we can say for our two remote callers, but we're very pleased to have Ireland editor Richard Forrestal and betting editor Keith Melrose on the line today. Welcome to you both. Okay, let's get cracking. We're going to dive straight in, John, with your story of the week, which is about honeysuckle. Take us away. Yeah, so this is a story I really wasn't expecting to read and has come from slightly left field and it's Henry de Bromhead basically opening up the possibility of Honeysuckle dual champion hurdle winner not running in the champion hurdle and instead going for the mayor's hurdle, which is slightly baffling. His quote is to the effect of, my job is to find her a race she can win. Obviously Constitution mm. Hill is her chief opposition uh, after impressing so much last time and Honeysuckle didn't impress last time, so I can understand the sort of, from a competitive angle, it's it's not going to be easy for her to win a champion hurdle, but at the same time, my heart says, this is the clash we've all been waiting for, it's the one we've been building up, we want to see Constitution Hill and Honeysuckle do it at Cheltenham. I, I understand why Henry de Bromhead has to keep his options open, because that is his job, to find winnable races, and he's going to, he doesn't have to commit to a race so far out, but if you're bidding for a third champion hurdle in a row, a, an amazing clash, it would be good mm. for the sport if she went down that line. So one, one to watch, I think. Big it's story. Massive story. I mean, there's been a lot of talk recently about ducking and diving and, and trainers, owners opting for easier races, avoiding uh, big challenges. But, but this is surely the, the ultimate example of it, where you've got a double champion hurdle winner, a winner of um, 12 grade ones as well, you know, I mean, if, 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 if she's going to duck a challenge and OK, the yeah. challenger is potentially a generational talent, then surely the sport's in a bit of trouble there. Well, it doesn't bode well at all, does it? And we've, you know, it's the equivalent of a sort of alti or something dodging, dodging one, a newcomer in the championship. I just don't really see it. If you've, she's good enough to win a champion hurdle still, it's not a case of uh, forms dipped so considerably that you understand <coughs> they might want to go out on a win and they've lost the unbeaten record so they just want to sign off nicely and I don't really buy that. I think she's still an exceptional racehorse and we have been building up this clash. They have engaged with it as well. The owners, uh, Kenny Alexander, has been very much looking forward, let's take on Constitution Hill, let's see what mm -hmm. he's got. It would be a huge, huge disappointment from a sporting perspective and from a fan perspective if she doesn't take on Constitution Hill. Worth noting, she still might. Obviously, this yeah. is just, we're keeping our options open and everything else a little bit of, I don't know if it's sort of Sir Alex Ferguson mind games or something like that, but it's, I'm praying that she does take him on and I'm praying she bounces back next time wins our race nicely, Constitution Hill at the festival, and that would be a race for the ages. The race we've all been waiting for. Uh, Richard, I want to bring you in here. Um, do you have sympathy with Henry de Bromhead identifying the mayor's hurdle as a potential uh, route for Honeysuckle, or, or are you in the camp that this would be completely the wrong way to go? Oh, it'd be completely the wrong way to go. Tom, look, anyone who, who's familiar with my um, opinions and writings on these kind of things over the past number of years will know how much I object to the way the programme book has been bloated and that's epitomised by the Cheltenham Festival going to four days and being diluted to the extent that it has already. Um, the mayor's hurdle came about because of the, the expansion of the programme there and the addition of the extra day and look at what it's doing now. This is this is the kind of thing we're dealing with. You should be at the Cheltenham Festival, which is the pinnacle uh, week of our sport. You should be compelling horses to take each other on and um, the best against the best, best to find out who is the, the king of the lot, if you like, or the queen of the lot, as it were. Um, and that's why even races like the Ryanair Chase, um, 
they're consolation races, if you like, for me, because you, you have, on the one hand, the two-mile champion chase and you have the Gold Cup. One is about the fastest horses in the land. The other is about the, the strongest stairs, the highest quality strong stairs. You stick in the Ryanair chase and all of you all of a sudden you've got a, a compromise. Um, you know, the ones who aren't fast enough to, to win a champion chase are not strong enough stairs to, to win a Gold Cup. They settle into the, to the, the, the mid-rank race of the three, if you like. This is the same thing. We've got a mayor's hurdle there. It's another option for high-class mayors. It shouldn't be there, in my opinion, at all. It's why we will probably never have a dawn run again, because why would you risk a high-class mayor going over fences and running them in the in the Gold Cup when you have, number one, the mayor's hurdle along the way, and now you also have the mayor's chase? It's a, it's a travesty, if you ask me, that the option is there. If it wasn't there, Henry de Bromwell wouldn't be considering it. By the time March comes around, she could have won four Irish champion hurdles. I'd, I'd fancy her to, to win uh, her fourth one when she goes back down in February. Uh, you know, I don't think there was an awful lot wrong with her performance the other day. She ran into a couple of good horses who were both ridden very cannily to kind of in her on the line, if you like. Um, it's an absolute... It, it'd be a disaster if it comes to it. I would hope, to be honest, that Kenny Alexander and Henry would maybe look at the bigger picture in, in time to come and, and come down on the sporting side of, of running or in the champion hurdle against Constitution Well Constitution Hill, sorry, all being well if they both get there in one piece. Yeah, I, I hope so as well, Richard. And I think if you look at Cheltenham Day One prices, what you're saying about the dilution of the programme at the festival becomes very starkly clear because right now, in mid-December, we have on the opening day of Cheltenham a five to four favourite of the Supreme, a five to four favourite of the Arco, although it's odds on with at least one bookmaker, a one to three favourite of the Champion Hurdle, and a two to one favourite now of the Mayor's Hurdle. And needless to say, Honeysuckle did go that route, she'd be a lot shorter. We also have a three to one favourite of the National Hunt Chase for what it's worth. I mean, Richard, that is not screaming elite sport, is it? No, exactly. Too many options, um, and they spread. They can spread out their their high profile, high quality horses to the races that they think have the best chance of winning, and they'll avoid they'll avoid the, the big clashes. And this is the perfect example of that. I know it mightn't happen. Hopefully, it won't. But there's an, a lot of water to cross under the bridge between now and next March. Constitution Hill mightn't even get there. Honeysuckle mightn't even get their 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 horses. And we know when you turn the screw at this level, they can they can break and Look, the, the travesty of it would be, for example, if you picture the half an hour around the champion hurdle time with the mayor's hurdle following it and say, by some misfortune, Constitution Hill fell at the first in the champion hurdle. Where is Honeysuckle at that time if, if they go down this road? She's walking around the pre-parader and getting, waiting to be saddled before the mayor's hurdle and the race would probably be hers for the taking in Constitution Hill's absence at that stage. We don't want to see that happening. Keith, I want to bring you in quickly on this one as well. If you are looking at the champion hurdle from a betting perspective, you know how do you assess it? If you if you were responsible for plotting Honeysuckle's target, would you be willing and uh, confident that she could give Constitution Hill a race? No, she won't. Nothing can give Constitution Hill a race. He's the best horse we've seen for years. Um, it's but but I have said I can't have a go at Henry de Bromhead for what he's done. He's playing the game that's in front of him. The problem is. The game's changed and we've not adjusted to it, really. You know, as it's all been touched upon, there's fewer good horses, there's more good races and what good horses there are concentrated in fewer hands. That describes the situation you're seeing there with four short price favourites on day one of the Cheltenham Festival. It'll be more by the time. I have no, quite, no doubt about that. And, you know, it, it's good for one type of punter, but for a lot of us, those of us who like the sort of challenge of it and want to see you know, are more interested from a sporting perspective than from a roll-up perspective. That's not that's not for us. That that's that's not as good a day. I mean, honeysuckle going to the champion hurdle for me, it's almost immaterial now because nothing's beating Constitution Hill. It'd have been great to see her do it. I'd like to have seen her do it because she had the reputation behind her. But I think in hindsight, the day she got beaten Hatton's Grace, that was a moment where we could go. She'll never race Constitution Hill. I fear you could be right, but but John, just to wrap this up again. You know, part of Constitution Hill becoming the giant that we think he could be mm. is surely that he's got to face the best around. And if the sport is structured in such a way that those challenges simply don't happen because the 
the, the, the rung down from the very best will just go for easier targets, then then what you've got there is not a functioning sport that, that that's going to reach out and, and engage people who are maybe not completely dyed in the wool racing fans. No, you're right. Something's not right. And, and I always think on the flat, for instance, racing is a test of the thoroughbred for their career as a stallion. And it's the same in jumps, you know, that essentially we're testing these horses every time we race them and you want them to be tested against the best horses, therefore setting that bar and finding out how good the horse you own is relative to the other horses in the population. Mm. If Constitution Hill is running against horses running for second and third at huge prices and not taking on a honeysuckle and not taking on these bigger names, as, uh, it's just bad. It's bad for the owner, it's bad for the sport and it's difficult to sell a sport where when those storylines aren't there because there's a lot of kind of niche things in racing and nuances and technicalities that appeal to the sort of hardened fan but if you're selling if i was to sell the first day of the cheltenham festival to someone who's never been you know i, I would say or, or that sorry the champion if i was to sell the champion hurdle to somebody who's never been i would say this is one really good exceptional young horse who might be one of the best we've seen versus a two-time winner that's a much easier sell yeah isn't it's it? it's those are the storylines we want to you sell know, it, it, you don't get usain bolt versus the you know the 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 fiftieth best sprinter in the world at the, yeah. the Olympics, you, and they don't you, dodge the Olympics because Usain Bolt's there. Exactly, exactly. Well, this story will run and run. I'm sure we will return to it. Let's hope Honeysuckle and Constitution Hill do meet each other at Cheltenham in March. Uh, we're going to move on to our second story, and and uh, Richard, I'm going to come to you for this one. What have you got for us? Yeah, it's in relation to. Uh, Rona McNally, uh, this is a case I suppose we've been waiting on for a couple of years at this stage. Um, and the IHRB published their findings last week in relation to it. It's a, a very elaborate um, case. Conspiracy basically is a word that's used um, and it's kind of far reaching. And I suppose maybe if I just summarize some of the aspects of it, it, it started really with um, the real deals, wins. Um, about two years ago now, just over two years ago, Navin in September, um, he won off a hurdle mark of 84. He nearly fell at first um, and he still uh, won pulling a train, as it were. Um, that prompted the IHR, the stewards on the day to refer to the IHRB. Um, and he had the distinction of being referred for a second time when he won on the flat at Limerick subsequently. That was off uh, a low mark as well, I think 45. So that was the start of it. Um, the horse went up and won, I think, six on the spin, including a couple on the flat. He ended up um, winning the Grade 2 Moscow Flyer Hurdle at Punchestone. He improved over four stone alarmingly. So, I mean, you know, it's it, to, to think any horse could progress to that level from a, a, a rating of 84 in the first instance, you know, it's it's a big, a, a big improvement. Um, it then kind of, if you remember, I, I actually did a column last year, um, there were a number of gambles being landed at the time, and, and the one that prompted the column was a call me Freddie Gamble at Cork, a Sam Curling Hearts. Uh, again, it, it was referred, and um, ultimately there was no case to answer in relation to that one. But at the same time, there had, had recently been a gamble involving one of David Dunn's horses, all class. Um, again, no previous evidence of, of any significant ability, uh, and she turned up at Navin then in March of last year off the mark, 48. Um, and bolted up, landed a big gamble, um, and continued to show improved form then uh, after that. No sooner had the, had the ink dried on that column than Full Noise won for David Dunn. Again, similar ga gamble, no previous uh, form, uh, and, and landed a hefty punch in, in good fashion. Now, at that time, we actually did a column, and between looking at all these cases, uh, I managed to join a few dots. Uh, and you could see the links, as it were, between maybe David Dunn and Rona McNally. And sure enough, that is what was published then last week um, in this finding. David Dunn was ultimately found to be training horses for Rona McNally. That ownership was concealed. They were both found guilty of concealing the ownership. Um, and then there was Kieran Fennessy brought into it as well. Kieran Fennessy is someone that they, uh, Rona McNally has done a lot of dealings with over the years. He sourced a lot of his good horses from him including the real deal and jam man, the jam man and so on. And he was brought into it um, on the basis of inside information being passed on to him from McNally. Um, and while done on the one hand, 
um, has been found guilty of misleading the stewards and um, concealing ownership. Kieran Fennessy, on the other hand, it, it looks a little bit more serious for him as well as McNally because he has ultimately been found to have brought the, the, the sport into disrepute um, in relation to the passing on of inside information. It seems to his father, Liam, and his brother, Aaron, who aren't licensed. So, you know, what sort of sanctions they might face, I don't know. Um, it, we're, I'll be focusing here on the licensed individuals, Rona McNally. I mean, there's a there's a list then in, rela- in relation to McNally um, failing to school uh, horse appropriately for stalls, failing to report issues relating to, to runs, you know, issues that may have impacted the run. I think there's about eight listed there, six for the real deal and a couple for the jam man. Um, he admitted not kind of revealing uh, relation uh, issues relating to a horse's health um, that arose from the Irish Equine Centre. I suspect this is relating to Aspergillus. Um, again, we're, it, one of the aspects of this, we, we weren't given a lot of details or evidence. We were just told the findings. But I suspect that's in relation to the Aspergillus, which um, by the looks of it, the horses were being run maybe when they were suffering from this and he didn't uh, relay that to the IHRB. Um, what else? Um, he, he was found guilty, obviously, of horses failing to ensure horses ran on, on their merits. Um, he was he rode the jam man in one of those instances at Navin, um, and ultimately he was found to have conspired with uh, with uh, Kieran Fennessy to engage in corrupt or fraudulent practice. Um, the, the one other interesting aspect among among many others was that um, there were findings here retrospectively in relation to the running and riding. So. Uh, McNally was found to have um, been guilty of the, the non-triers rule in relation to the jam man, and so was Owen O'Brien, the amateur rider. Um, now, that's unusual because we haven't had cases where they've, where they've gone back and looked at cases and found them to have been guilty retrospectively. So that's another interesting angle to it. Um, look, it's it's a long and exhaustive charge sheet. It's the kind of thing we'd want a little bit more detail on because although they've given us the, this raft of findings, we don't know what they have used to, to, to come to these conclusions, really. The BHA is the betting integrity uh, partner for the IHRB. We don't know if, if we have um, betting evidence of horses being backed or laid by the Fennessies, for example. We don't know um, we don't know an awful lot of the, the intricate detail of it. But at the moment, looking at what the, the findings have suggested um, and, and knowing the scope of a referral panel's powers, Rona McNally is most likely looking at losing his license um, and he could face significant fines as well. So it's um, it's a, a bizarre sort of case. It's unfortunate. Um, I think the conversation over the last week or so has turned to, um, you know, they're hitting the small man and I can relate to that. I can see why people would feel that when you look at Maybe what goes on in the sport more generally, um, you know, we all know, I suppose, how to, how you have to use the system to some extent when we acknowledge that um, maybe Mr. McNally is guilty of abusing the system a little bit. You know, that, that could be one interpretation of it. Um, it was a fairly blatant case in relation to the, the real deal, um, you know, to go f- over four stone. Um, and, and I thought one of the interesting um, phrases they used here in in convicting him was, um, and if you just let me find it, uh, the evidence in relation to, you know, I'll read, the, I'll read the whole line. It is alleged that Mr. McNally failed to ensure that his horses ran on their merits and or that he used the race course as a training ground by running horses insufficiently schooled in order to obtain handicap marks not reflective of their ability in advance of their handicap run. And this is the interesting bit. The evidence is to be found in a pattern of running of his horses in a number of races already referred to in the report above. So there's various races that are highlighted there um, and we're retrospectively being told that he was using the race courses at schooling ground ultimately or, or the horses were running and, and not being allowed to run on their merits. So that's all very interesting that they're going back retrospectively and marking the stewards homework if you like. It's not the sort of thing that's been done before and it's 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 a fairly damning case from Rona McNally's point of view. It'll be, as, as we, and maybe I didn't allude to, the sanctions hearing won't be till January, whenever they can get everyone convened. At some stage in January, we'll learn a bit more about it. But it's, as I say, 
a fairly damning uh, finding. Yeah, lots to unpack here, Richard. Um, well, first of all, you said um, in January they'll, they'll, they'll have this sort of sentencing. You, you mentioned he's likely to lose his license, but but what level of potential punishment might there be here? And and, and indeed, we should add before that that uh, McNally has indicated he will appeal uh, the, the 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 judgment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, there were certain points on this he admitted. I think he admitted, you know, in relation to, to not not um, furnishing them with certain information in relation to the Irish Equal Centre findings. Again, whatever that may be, as I say, I suspect it's Aspergillus. Um, look, they could, they, I believe the, the referrals panel could find them up to 100 grand for each, uh, each um, guilty finding, if you like. You know, I think that's probably unlikely. Um, but I suspect he's going to be looking at um, you know, unless his appeal is successful, if he does appeal, I'm not aware that has happened yet. You know, he's going to be looking at a hefty five-figure fine, surely. And you'd imagine he's going to lose his license for a period of time. I wouldn't care to speculate on it, but you know, Charles Burns lost his license for six months for, you know, ultimately not 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 having a horse watched constantly at Tremor when the Viking Horde case blew up. Um, yeah, you know, there was no finding in relation to Charles Burns uh, betting activity or anything like it or conspiring to, you know, do the betting public, if you like, in relation to a horse's handicap mark or anything. And he got six months for that. Um, so I don't know. Um, it's going to be very interesting. But you'd imagine um, if they follow through on what they're suggesting here and if they have all the corroborating evidence, which you'd imagine they have, um, it's unusual that they haven't published it. And I thought it was interesting last week that Ronan McNally said um, he wasn't passing informa inside information on. He said the fantasy said he wasn't passing in inside information on. And he said there was no evidence to suggest he was passing inside information on. So in a, in a situation like that, you just wonder why they haven't published whatever corroborating evidence they have. But if they have this evidence and if it all stacks up, then you'd imagine the sanction is going to be significant. And I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll return to this story uh, when that uh, when that that evidence is published, uh, Richard. One last question: uh, The committee said that uh, these actions had caused serious damage to the interests of horse racing in Ireland. How serious is the damage? It's it look. It's not great, but um, there is an element here. Like we were talking about the mayor's hurdle and the Ryanair case and all this, and how it's the system as much as anything that's causing the problem and you can't blame Henry the Bromid for wanting to run in the race. He thinks he's got the best chance of winning. And we're looking here at a system issue as well. Um, if you're a trainer in Ireland and you're trying to compete with Willie Mullins and Maiden Hurdles and Gordon Elliott and Maiden Hurdles, um, you're on a hiding to nothing because if, you know, invariably you're not going to beat them and if you get too, too close, you're going to ruin your handicap mark. So the smaller operators have to try and work within that system and we know this is the way racing is done for years and years. You know, you look at Sir Mark Prescott, who's renowned for keeping a little bit up his sleeve and, and delivering on the horses when it matter, when it's expected, if you like. So this is an extreme example of that. And I think what McNally is guilty of here as much as anything is is going a bit too far in, in the sense that he's, he's left a lot of people with red faces in the case of the real deal in, in particular. Um, so how much damage has it done to, to Irish racing um, and its perception? Look, there's obviously reputation damage when something like this comes up. But uh, at the same time, I think people realise that there is, um, for want of a better phrase, there's a game here that's being played and it's being played on a daily basis. Um, and if we want to do something about it, then that has to be addressed. And there's no good shooting fish in a barrel, small people like Ron and McNally, who ultimately can't really fight back. Um, you know, there's plenty of bigger, stronger sharks in the ocean who could be targeted and probably are targeted. So, as I say, if, if we want to address this properly, it's the kind of thing that has to be done in, in, a, in a holistic manner, if you like. Um, and horses have to maybe not be judged on one good run or there has to be some sort of a hand, handicapping amnesty to give the smaller operators a chance to be competitive. Because if they show their hands in full with uh, horses, that are going to be, you know, getting on the coattails of, of um, David Jennings mentioned Fasel Vague at the weekend, then they're not going to be, they're not going to have a functioning business model. It's as simple as that. So, yeah, it has brought a, 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 
a bit of negative publicity. There's absolutely no doubt about it, but it's a broader issue um, than just this one. I think this is one where if you begin pulling on the thread, it will go places you don't uh, necessarily expect. It's a fascinating story. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, we'll move on to the third story, and this is uh, the one I'm going to nominate. And John, this one's following up um, a three-part series we ran in the paper and online for subscribers last week, uh, basically looking at betting shops, their past, uh, um, what they're like today, and, and where the future might lie. They were really interesting pieces um, sort of visiting uh, the, 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 the gamut of different betting shops out there from sort of old school places, still have that community feel to some of the modern ones, which can sometimes be, you know, quite soulless, to be frank. And then finally visiting a, uh, a modern uh, future betting shop with lots of digital screens, really nice sort of distressed wood furniture, got that sort of like <laughs> Scandi uh, warehouse Ikea. vibe sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, Really good reads, first of all. But what I thought was uh, fascinating was, was just some of the, uh, the the data and insights in there about where betting shops are and, and where they're going. Uh, and, and two sort of key ones I thought I'd, I'd bring up here. You know, the first was just the scale of the decline in betting shops over the last few years because we've had two massive shocks to the system. They had um, FOBTs being, uh, the fixed-odds betting terminals being restricted from £100 to £2 a spin um, in 2019. And then in 2020, of course, the pandemic, which shut down retail for, for, for several weeks and, and, and created a very difficult operating environment. And the net cost of that basically is that from 8,320 betting shops in 2019, we are now at 6,219. So that's a fall of 25%. Mm. And obviously all 2,100 of those betting shops was paying media rights, they were they were contributing to the levy. So there's a direct knock-on impact on racing's revenues. And the second was just about how the ter- the turnover uh, sort of take has changed or, or the in, in shops and how racing, which is still the dominant uh, business in shops, has been in sort of slow decline over mm-hmm. the years and, and now has fallen from about 55% of takings to less than 50% now with, with football being the main beneficiary. But then online, the picture being very different where racing and football are basically on a par, basically. And that really sort of indicates to me, I think, both uh, the, the sort of demographics of the racing audience um, and potentially the demographic challenge facing uh, retail betting shops. Um, but where do you think betting shops lie? Do, they, do you think betting shops have a long-term future if, if we're sort of uh, pacing the streets of uh, of London in 2045? Will, will there be betting shops? Oh, it's a big question. I mean, there's there's a direction of travel, which is south, unfortunately. But I think retail, surprisingly, I know it's a, a noticeable drop over the, the years, but I think it's probably even surprised a few people how resilient it has been in a way. I know that sounds a little mm. bit... Uh, unorthodox given the, the decline in the numbers. Well, people but, did predict a higher decline. Yeah, the but they have proved yeah. fairly resilient. Um, I remember speaking to Stuart Kenny, of, formerly of Paddy Power, who was saying there will always be retail, there will always be a place for them. I'm not convinced long, long term, but in the immediate future that all the right things are being done to modernise them and make them an interesting and accessible place to go. And as those pieces quite nicely showed, that there is a, still a feeling of community in there. Um, it's difficult. I think perhaps at times they suffer through association. I think certainly among my peers, the perception is if you're going into a betting shop, you maybe have an unhealthy relationship with gambling and or you're going in there for the fixed odds and the machines Mm -hmm. rather than necessarily placing a bet on the horses. I think that's unfair. But I think there's certainly their image is something that they'll, they'll be very conscious of if they're to have a, a long term future. And, and fixed odds betting term was obviously played a big role in that. And, and in some ways, these sort of future betting shops trying to present a very different image. And as um, well with I remember doing um, kind of charting the rise of AAA and they were very interested in buying William Hill's retail uh, sort of operation and getting involved with taking over those shops. So for a, if a operator like that sees a future in them, then it can't as be can't be as bad as perhaps was originally built. Uh, yeah. There's clearly some sort of juice to be taken from them still, but whether in the you know many years down the line they're still a, a part of the high street, I don't know. 
Keith, how do you see the future of betting shops unfolding? I think it depends to a large extent on societal uh, perceptions of gambling generally because the the main draw of a betting shop to, uh, today is still the social element of it. I've been to one of those shops in the future. I went to Vicar Lane in Leeds recently and it's a quite an impressive setup actually. That shop's set up like a little bit like a warren so there's lots of little areas where uh, customers can, can have that social element as well as having all the, the what's available to them. But that's all available online and what retail has in terms of betting is is that social element is being there you know i went to a shoe shop immediately straight after being in that shop and i could tell you the difference between retail and online in terms of buying shoes but i couldn't tell you the only difference when it comes to going to betting shops over doing so online it's not about information it's not about holding the product in your hand it's about being in a social environment and that has to persist for betting shops to be a particularly viable um retail outlet over the longer term so it's that's not a rosy thing to say because we know the way that gambling is being treated generally in a society these days you know i think and it's because it's grown too fast you know it's grown from being behind the beaded curtain to becoming this absolute giant in the space of 10 15 years um so i'm not especially hopeful. I see a lot of good work being done. And the fact that these big firms are investing so heavily in the retail space tells me they think there's life to be breathed into the retail space. I'm not certain it'll be in their control, the long term future of, of retail betting. I think as well, one of the things that they uh, struggle with with the, with the new shops is, is the limitations on what you can offer in a betting shop, because we, we all know the sort of uh, the, the trope of getting a, a, a cup of instant coffee, but that is literally pretty much all they're allowed to do. And if you want to create a sort of cafe vibe, but you can't sell pastries and, uh, uh, and sandwiches, then, you know, you've got a little bit of a challenge. And that's, that's definitely something where, you know, if the government, which is not generally minded to do anything to alleviate the pressure on bookmakers, was minded to make that, that retail sector a little bit more robust, I think that could actually have quite a big impact. Well, yeah, then you've got PMU cafes, haven't you? Uh, and you know they're a very successful, successful enterprise in France. It's yeah, only. exactly. It's <laughs> uh, Well, obviously, there's a lot more uh, government vested interest in making sure the PMU's takings are really high. But that uh, I, this is a similar point to what I was making, really, in the sense that a lot of these things that would make retail an attractive environment is, is is going to have to be legislative. And at the moment, you know, the sort of media and societal portrayal of gambling is not in a favourable place to to grease the wheels to make that happen. So that that's why I think it's potentially unlikely. I agree that that's the way things would go to make retail betting uh, a long secure its long term future. I struggle to see it. I wouldn't be backing it even for sure. Richard, just quickly. The Irish perspective, how are betting shops faring um, over the water? Yeah, no, it's held up quite well, similar to there. I mean, it's it's held up uh, reasonably well in the greater scheme of things. Um, and you look at the betting ring, we talk about it similarly. Um, and you look at our, you know, our own industry newspapers um, and what sort of future any of these things have. But they continue to, you know, they're, they're, they're more resilient than we kind of, Feel there might be, but the one thing I thought was interesting in relation to this is whether at some stage there'll be a push back against online because of the affordability checks and whatnot that are coming in, and whether that will will be a boon for for shops, you know, and that there'll be a return of cash, um, um, because when you see the obstacles that people are facing with these affordability checks, you just wonder if there's going if it's going to work in in the favour of, of retail that people will be trying to avoid a lot of the hassle and just go and have their bet in cash. And there's something to be said uh, in terms of keeping an eye on what you're spending on gambling and that as well. It's something, something that several of our uh, tipsters sort of recommend as well. Put your bets on in cash. You, it's easier to keep track of them. Um, mm. Thanks so much, guys. We're, we're, we're going to move on to the final story. Uh, Keith, we're coming to you and you've got another uh, big, big talking point for us. Well, yeah, it's become a talking point in the last week, hasn't it? Even though the story's existed since July, it's the Whip Review and how that has shaped uh, how in the last week jockeys have essentially broken rank to talk about it. Uh, finally, the the Whip being moved into striking horses only in the backhand position, uh, and how the sanctions will involve disqualification and the most serious breaches. Now, obviously, that came out, and I was at the time surprised at how little furore it caused when when the consultation was first revealed. Um, 
Uh, but in the last week, it turns out that, that the jockeys have all broken the dam at once and come out and, and spoken in depth about their opposition to these new rules, which will come into force for jump jockeys a month before the Cheltenham Festival. So, you know, timing wise, I can definitely see the the issue here. Now, the interesting part of this story is is obviously the jockeys breaking ranks, which creates a couple of things. Firstly, is as John has actually done himself, he's talked about the um, where's the PGA and all this. It looks like senior jockeys are at loggerheads with their representative body on this, basically from the outside. And the PGA need to speak pretty quickly from the time of recording to to try and put that to bed because it's starting to look quite bad for them. But it also talks about the direction of travel for the whip generally. Now, there's a letter in, I think it was Sunday's Racing Post, from my old boss, Jeff Greetham, who talked about how if your desire was to deal with perception in the sport, your first move would have been to ban raising the whip above shoulder height. Moving the whip to the backhand position does look a lot more of a drastic step and potentially looks like it's it's on the way to to phasing out the whip as well. So we've got these two strands of it competing. The most immediate story for this week is how for, it's not often you see the PGA completely at loggerheads with their the representatives. You know, we talk about, we can go back to the sort of the bad old days really of the Bryony Frost case with the PGA stance, unfortunately, to align with a lot of the senior jockeys, whereas in this instance, it doesn't seem to have been the case. And it's interesting because obviously we had some senior jockeys in Tom Scudamore and PJ McDonald on that panel. Now, what this actually means for what happens when these things come into force, uh, we had the banning of the, we've got a little recent precedent on this actually, they banned the whip for encouragement in Sweden uh, after using it had been restricted to I think three strikes until this t- in January this year, they brought in some new rules, and within two weeks of them being in place, there was threat of strike action from jockeys. Now the situation is very different here. That in, that in, incident in Sweden was to do with a very specific wording of the rules, which was necessitated by the way that Swedish and Scandinavian jockeys had learnt to ride around heavily restricted use of the whip and there was a wording to the rules that ended up being interpreted poorly by stewards and ended up with all these uh, all these threats of strike action and they eventually didn't backtrack but they had to rewrite the rules mm-hmm. hastily and as far as I know it's not actually been corrected yet so this is how explosive it could potentially get if jockeys choose to go a certain way once the new rules come into force but you expect they'll need to be singing from the same sheet as the PGA by that point if anything like that's to happen. Yeah, the PJA, um, I think it'd be more accurate to say, just kind of not really present in this conversation, which is um, quite unusual. Uh, Richard, it's, well, Tom, you say that, but I, I mean, I, I, we can assume at the moment, the fact they have been silent is sort of taken as an assumption that because they were involved in a consultation, mm. that they're endorsing the consultation. Is that not a reasonable thing? To, I think, to I think it's, a, it's a reasonable assumption. They weren't, uh, they had, well, there were two jockeys who were represented on the, uh, the whip, uh, steering group, uh, Tom Scudamore and PJ McDonald and the PGA were, uh, were were consulted as well. But again, I think the absence of commentary from them is, is, is a slightly unusual one, especially now when you see so many jockeys coming out and raising concerns principally about this uh, move to, to uh, ban the forehand whip. Um, Richard, you're a former jockey. Uh, talk us through the differences between a forehand and backhand uh, whip strike. The, the forehand and backhand. The, the, the backhand position is presented as um, being less forceful, which is fair enough. I wouldn't challenge that. What I would say is that um, the backhand position for most jockeys, and if, if I can, you can see me here, I think, if I if I go like this and I and I bring my stick down here, it's coming down a lot shorter on the horse than if, if I do it in the forehand position. I bring I can bring it further back much easier. So they presented this at the time as being um, you know a way forward, and it is to do with the flick of a wrist if you like, rather than a, a more forceful forearm position. But I I don't believe that it's going to help the situation at all because you want to hit the horse when you're hitting it um, behind the rib cage on the rump, on the horse's rear end where there's a big mass of flesh. Whereas this is going to shorten the strike and it's going to bring it down much more regularly on the rib cage where there's no flesh, very little flesh, as you know, um, and it's going to create a lot more problems. Um, and I, I, 
I'm surprised it's taken the jockeys this long. Um, I'd echo Ruby Walsh on this because I did a column in July about this and I made this point that, you know, this doesn't make sense. This idea that um, the backhand position is going to create fewer problems than the forehand position. It just didn't stack up. Um, you know, because there is much less flesh and meat above the rib cage, and because you're more likely to come down short on the rib cage, it's going to create more issues. Um, so I, I just don't really get it. Um, I can see some of the, I can see the thinking that, that led them here, that it's more of a wrist action and it will be less forceful. But I still don't know how they ended up agreeing on it, having consulted with the jockeys, because as you say, Tom Scudamore and PJ McDonald were involved. Um, no, uh, I, I just, and I, I've got a Tom, a Tom Scudamore quote here, and, and I don't want to uh, sort of single out yeah. Tom Scoo, but I think it's a relevant one because he says, using the whip in the backhand position, the natural arc uh, means that it more frequently lands in the right place with the appropriate amount of force. So, you know, clearly, although it seems that there's a very large number of jockeys who, who, who agree yeah. with your take, Initially, at least, um, as part of the steering review group, um, Tom, Tom Scudamore was, was, was sort of saying this would encourage uh, the right kind of whip use. Yeah, I, I just don't understand it. I don't see how they, Tom kind of came off to, to signing off on that view. But that's his, maybe that's his opinion. But again, you would have thought he was speaking on behalf of the jockeys as a whole. Um, but to me, it didn't make sense then. And you can see now to the, to, the, to the vast majority of the riders, it doesn't appear to make sense at this stage. Um, look, I, the, the, the frustration with this, and again, you'll be familiar with my views on this, Tom. I mean, if, if we accept, and I believe it is accepted that the whip, a foam padded whip used correctly um, in the correct place without excessive force, without excessive frequency, is not a welfare issue, then we shouldn't be going down this road at all. Now, if we're, if we're going down this road anyway, it just seems to be a case of addressing the optics of the situation rather than the, sig the substance of it, which, you know, is that is this a welfare issue? I believe it's not, and I believe the BHA will tell you it's not. So why we have gone down this road at all, I really don't know. Uh, John, the other controversy here is around the timing of these changes. Yeah. Um, the point has been made, I think quite fairly, that if you're bringing in a major change to the whip rules with significant increased bands, and most importantly, perhaps of all, this change to technique, doing it a month before the biggest festival in your sport, when the eyes of the nation and the sporting world are, are, are on you like never before, perhaps not the wisest move. No, I don't think so. And, and timing is the key word in, in many senses with this situation, with the, the jockeys speaking out firstly. Yes, they've had many months, but the implementation period was only relatively recently announced, sort of last month. So yeah. they have had a few weeks of just having conversations with the stewards and learning that they would have been banned many more times than is sensible if it's your livelihood. So I do believe that it has perhaps dawned on the jockeys in a big way. Obviously, they've, they've known about it and would have had their own concerns but I, I sense the gravity of the change has hit them and the issue with the timing has hit them most importantly why for me why would you not introduce it for jump jockeys before a sort of quieter spell of the season you know could we have jump jockeys using it in the summer not to mm. just put push summer racing as a secondary thing but it seems like a logical time rather than before the biggest week of your season in yeah. theory for many of these jockeys it just seems sort of poorly thought out and there are going to be people who have who like richard take sort of not take issue but are concerned by why we've gone down this route i think it was well intentioned i think optics are more important than perhaps they're often given credit for as long as you set out that that's what specifically what you're doing but i just think this is so far is creating more problems than it's solving. The optics of jockeys refusing to ride is far worse than them having a, a slightly ineffective whip uh, action. And the, the, the PJA, as I wrote uh, in today's paper, they may be having conversations on the side. You know, they may be talking to these senior jockeys, perhaps they're even driving it, I'm not sure. But publicly, at least, they have not come out and issued an update to we we're receptive and we're willing to take these changes on 
and they need to because there is essentially an open rebellion among their jockeys at the moment. They, they might be allied behind the scenes, but that's no good from the outside. They need to say, stand up and say, right, this is what our senior jockeys think. We might have said this before, but this is our stance as of today. Let's open up a constructive dialogue because we do not want to get to that betting in period and that implementation period for jump jockeys and it be bans galore, chaos, jockeys unhappy, because that is a terrible look for a project that was essentially designed to improve the optics. The other thing to note, of course, is this is the first controversy involving the PGA since Paul Schroeder's left. We've got new leadership uh, at the PGA now, so this is an interesting test for the new leadership. Yeah, very much so. And I think there's one other point I just, I, I'm, I just have a worry about with the new whip rules, and it concerns disqualification. Um, and the fact that if someone goes, I think it's four strikes over the limit, they will not be disqualified in the day. The result will stand for betting purposes. And at a later point, a, a, a sort of review panel will determine whether they're disqualified. But of course, everyone can count. Mm. <clears throat> so if you see a jockey go way over in a major race, you know, we could be in the we could be we could be stood there after the gold cup, um, hailing a Plutard, but knowing that there's a very good probability that the horse is going to be thrown out a few days later. I see why they've done that for betting reasons, but that to me feels like a recipe for a complete fiasco. No, you're absolutely right. And the, the problem is that disqualification is such a big word and has so many ramifications because it's jockeys, it's owners, it's trainers, it's everybody else. Betting purposes, media, it's so many different people will, if the disqualification takes place, be impacted. So they're trying to tiptoe around it in a way that doesn't penalise people too badly or immediately. And I, ju I just think it's... You ha clarity is so important on these things and if a, if a horse is being disqualified it just go f make it immediate if, if that's what you think and then it can be perhaps appealed at a later date rather than ha like you say having the winner having the winning quotes having the write-up in the paper and then a few weeks later oh wait a minute we have a new winner give them a call it just doesn't it's, it's, it doesn't work yeah who, can i come in there tom like, who, yeah. who who does that work for right because you have for, the, the first pass it's, it's betting only. It, they've done it for betting yeah. reasons because the bookie said it would be a complete disaster if we have horses being thrown out for for whip offences. Punters will be yeah. up in arms. So they've come to this compromise. But it, I think it just it, it completely invalidates the sort of sporting element of it. Yeah, but what about the people who back the second horse? Oh yeah, who know? Oh, well, indeed, who, absolutely. Who, who know they're they're going to the, the result is going to be overturned in a week's time, and and they've done their money. So I don't see how it works for anyone. It's just one of the most farcical things I've ever read. Um, you know, so you've got the, the winning connections picking up their trophy, standing on the stand, getting their picture with the trophy. The horse has been hit five times more. So they know they're going to lose the race in a week's time. I mean, what's going to, what sort of a look is going to be on their faces for those pictures? And what do we do? Them? What are we doing? What, is, what does ITV Racing do? You know, we, yeah. we, we sort of go, well, Apu Tard has won the Gold Cup, but... Uh, kind of not though as well. It's I, I just don't see how it works for anyone. It's absolutely bizarre that they thought this was a good idea. Yeah, I, I this one feels like I mean we all know the whip is such a naughty subject. Um, I've no doubt that everyone involved in this whip review uh, had good intentions, but it feels like one uh, which is going to cause some problems whenever it is rolled out, if it is rolled out on the current timetable. Uh, Gentlemen, we, we better wrap it up there. It's uh, There's been some fantastic talking points uh, today and it's a hard one to determine which is the biggest. But John, I'm going to have to go with, with Honeysuckle because simply Honeysuckle versus Constitution Hill was supposed to be the clash of the titans around which the entire season was built around. And the idea it might not happen is just so disappointing. Um, but it also speaks to you know some of the big issues affecting the sport you know, this, this ducking and diving, the ability of, of, of trainers and owners to avoid tough races and the, uh, the, the sort of expansion of the fixture list, which has facilitated that. So well done. Great story. Award winning story right there. OK, so that's a wrap for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. It only remains for me to say if you haven't already, do download the new app. It is absolutely packed with everything a racing fan needs from great content, tipping, uh, live racing, incredible race cards, and lots more besides. And please do like, subscribe, and share uh, the Racing Post YouTube account. 
Thank you again for joining us. Uh, we'll be back again next week. I've been Tom Kerr. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>